Good afternoon, everybody, to another episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast. I'm your host, Nick Allard with AA Real Estate Group and the Complete Deal Flow System.com. Join us today while we go through all things real estate and bring you top notch professionals, all who believe in a get it done manner. Today, we have another friend of mine in the mastermind. We appreciate him very, very much. It's a new, different kind of topic today. I can't think that we've ever had a note guy on this podcast before. I think this might be the first time. So, Fuquan, welcome to the show, man. I really appreciate it, Nick. Thanks for having me on. It's a privilege, actually, and an honor to be here to kind of explain my story, my journey with your listeners. So, I'm excited, man. That's awesome. And I know we talked a little bit about that journey before. I would love you to share your story now, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, I started off in real estate in 99. Before that, I was into sales. And I was a a director of sales. I did some telecommunications stuff, lived in California for a couple of years. That company got shut down and I kind of transferred into a, uh, a company that did computers. So my job as a director of sales, we ran 120,000 square foot facility. And this was a corporate job I had, of course. And my goal was to bring business in the house. We did computer repair down to the micro trip level, fruit fill replaceable units for any of you techie guys out there. And I had landed a very large account with Sony Lowe's. It kind of brought me over, you know, six figures. I was 24 years old. And I remember my boss at the time, they took me out to lunch, two guys, and they said, hey, we really didn't know you was going to land an account this big. We wasn't expecting for you to generate so much income for the company. We're really excited. Can you do it again? And I was like, sure, I got a few more in the pipeline. And my projections, that would have brought me well close to $200,000. So they said, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to lower your base down um, and we're going to keep your commission where it's at, but we're going to lower your base down. (laughs) So I went from an $85,000 base to a $35,000 base. You know, I still was close, somewhere around my 85, 90,000, but I just thought it was a stab in the back. So I was at the time actually shadowing my cousin who did real estate. He flipped a couple of deals and he made half my paycheck. And this, we've always been competitive since we were younger. So I started to shadow him some more. You know, within a couple of months, I was able not to figure it all out because I'm still learning real estate to this day. You always have to be a student of the business. But I figured enough out to be able to put a deal together and make, you know, a decent size paycheck. And I mean, like 30000 or something like that, if I can remember my first deal. So I put my two-week notice in right away. And I just jumped out the window and grew wings flying down, came into the market of 99. And I remember at the time, we had about 17 properties lined up. Like my job was, my older brother had did mortgages. And he's been trying to get me into the mortgage business when I was working in corporate. I was like, ah, I got a steady paycheck. I don't want to wait a month to get paid. I don't want to stack them up and then wait to get paid because that's how the, the business works. It's all commission. But he would teach me things and I would read books and stuff he had. And I learned that side of the business, which really helped me out when I got into real estate because my cousin was good at the construction side and I was good at helping people package their paperwork together to qualify for loans and stuff like that. And then find them a lender that will help them, you know, get the finance of a house. So I would do seminars on how do you, you know, put documents together, what they're expecting. I built up this buyer's list, which was really good. And it gave us an opportunity to put like 17 properties in the contract. Then one day, March uh, 30th, 2001, because we were helping people in the community with the construction and we were paying cash, I got set up to like a botched robbery. So I got shot like five times, right? Almost lost my life. Whoa, whoa. No, no. You got to back up. You gotta talk <laughs> that was about the best this. thing that ever happened to me, though. I'm telling the truth. That's the best thing that ever happened to me when I got shot because it really made me understand the importance of life. Like people take for granted the small things like tying your freaking shoes or just taking a crap. Like, you know, the smallest things that I, I was not able to do when I was in that position. And it took me about six months to really heal. And I went deep within and and understanding really what my worth, what my value was. I didn't have any kids at the time. So it really made me look at life different and just be grateful for everything. So during that period of six months, I was in a hospital for like a week. The bullets went in and out, didn't really touch anything, but I had to heal up. So it took me six months of being home, of healing and, and doing therapy. But during those six months, I just went into beast mode. And because I was really good at finding buyers, I mean, at the time we had like 17 properties lined up. So those eventually started to close and fall like dominoes. And I was able to benefit from that. And I was able to put together a better training program to educate people. I was able to read more, do more research. And then I started doing phone calls, calling people. And instead of having a room where people come in, I would do conference calls and build things up like that. So I always had a strong buyers list in the market. And then I really started to connect with a lot of sellers who had product who couldn't move it. 
And I would make that connection. And then pretty much that's how it was compensated. I ran into one investor. Who, Sorry to interrupt you, Fuquan. So that was, was that like on the wholesale side or the agency side or how was that? Yeah, that was like on the agency side. Um, I told you my brother ran a brokerage, so he was doing loans and stuff. So I was able to introduce people and basically get like a referral fee or something that way. I didn't really become a loan officer because I didn't want to really get into that and, and go through that whole process. Um, later on, eventually, I did become a loan officer, but in the very beginning, I didn't. I wanted to stay on the investment side. So the pivotal moment for me was I had an investor who had over 60 properties in her portfolio. And to me, she was like the queen of real estate at the time. We're talking like, you know, late 2001, 2002. And I was like, hey, I can sell all these properties, you know, just give me a chance. So we made the connection. I started selling properties like crazy. And I went to a closing one day and um, the attorney actually, two things happened to me. The attorney actually sent the package to my office by mistake, her package. That it was for me because I closed on a property. So it was for me. My package came to my office, had my company name on it. And I opened it up and it had the loan payoff discharge information to the lender who that person borrowed money from. So I'm like, okay, this is a, a, a lender who funds people to buy houses. So I did some research on them. They're right in New York. I put a package together of all the closings that I did for various investors and, w- and what I did in the business. And it was like, oh, you're the guy who's selling all these properties. So we made a connection directly and it wasn't nothing behind her back because I did tell her, Hey, I got this information by accident. You know, I want to go ahead and do a relationship with them. And she was like, the way we're doing it, trust me, you're better off. You're doing it better off. You're making a piece because the way they were structured was okay. You're going to get the property. I'm going to deed the property over to you. I'm going to become the lender. Right. And then you own a property, you do your construction and you go from there and you just pay me. So no, I don't know no, if you this, got this that. Is, this is really good. I want to focus yeah. on this. So if we take a step back, she, so who was this? This lady was the owner of the property, but was she? She was the owner of the property. So yeah. it was sort of like a wrap, right? So she actually took a mortgage on the property and instead of her going through the process of doing construction, let's say the property was worth 200,000. She got, you know, she purchased the property for 40,000, 45,000. That's what they were going for back then. And basically she got a loan from them for 60 or whatever she did, took money off the top. Now she had a loan in for 60. She gave it to me. She would say, hey, I'm going to give you this property for 90 and you go ahead and do what you're going to do with it. You're going to record it in your name. I'm going to put a lien on the property for the difference of the what I owe on it and, the, and the, what you're paying me. So at the closing, you have to pay off these two mortgages. I see. So, OK, sorry. She set up some, something like a wrap. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. So then you got it for 40. She had it for 60. Sent it to you for 90. And then she put like a, a mortgage on it for 90. Right. So it would pay her well, off for the, for the 30 for the difference. She put the mortgage on for the difference. So the property had two liens on it. Gotcha. Uh, one was subject to and then the other one was her, her mortgage. So she essentially went in second position. And then I had to go through the process. It was deferred for six months. So I had to rehab it and sell it within six months and basically pay it off. Back then, there wasn't no seasoning. It was it wasn't really you know, I wasn't doing full gut rehabs like I'm doing now. It was just like, okay, new light fixtures. We're going to go and put new bathroom fixtures, pop in new kitchen fixtures. We're going to do commercial carpet through the whole freaking house, the hallway and everything. We're going to patch the roof up and boom, we're done. So a little different back then, the way we're doing things versus now, you know, and it was very good for me because I was able to see what it was of being in that position. But what she said was true, What she said, hey, you don't want to put in that position because it's more involved. If you're dealing with the lender directly, you got to make interest payments. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I was like, no, 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 no. I want to do it. So these guys, they gave me a million dollar line of credit out the gate. Of course, I had to pay points on it because I did it. I showed them the volume I was doing. And basically, you know, that, that held a lot of weight because a lot of the players they were lending money to, I was the one who was moving the properties for them. So they gave me the million dollar line of credit. It was an 80% that they put up and I had to put up 20%. So I had to go get additional financing for investors to put up that 20% to gap money. And I was able to go from there. Fuquan, when you brought them your own package of the one deal, right? Like, was it just a normal, like it's a standard, either conventional or commercial lender where you basically had to show them ARV rehab budget and purchase price. And they would then, you know, do 80% of appraised value. Is that what happened? Or Absolutely. So this was actually a heart money lender. They wasn't like an institutional, like a Lima one or anchor or one of those guys. They were just, you know, a lender at the time. There was a car- gallery, Galler fine funding and Carnegie Capital was their name. For anybody who's in New Jersey, they, they pretty much know about them. They funded a lot of Jersey deals, New York deals, Atlanta deals back in 2000, you know, all the way up to the market crash. But yeah, those guys, they had private investors. They, they kind of did like a syndication where they 
pooled money together and took down properties one at a time. And they charged 16% and, and four points. Oh, <laughs> that was the cost cool. of the money back then. All so depends it was really, on the deal, right? <laughs> and it was one year. So that, was, that was it. That was their program. 80%. We give you rehab money, 100% of rehab money. We charge 16% interest and we want four points. So that was the cost of the money. I wasn't really that educated back then. I knew that they was essentially my partner. You know, I had the skirt and they had the hat with the feather, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the real deal. But fast forward from there, I had the opportunity to get a relationship with them. And I found another funding partner that was fallout. People that work for them fell out and kind of started their own thing. And they knew me. So that gave me another line of credit. So I had these $2 million line of credit and I didn't know what to do. I was like, wow, this is great. I'm on top of the world. And, um, you know, I was still closing and making a lot of money and I wasn't really connected to any mastermind groups or connected to anybody. I was in my own world. I really wasn't paying attention to the news and what was happening. I thought I was on the top of the world, you know, buying all the cars and, you know, the houses and traveling all over and just thought it would never end. And um, I wasn't renting properties. I was just flipping properties. I had no rental income or anything. And I started to see the market slow down for me, like in 2006, 2007, became more competitive, more people getting involved. Pricing started to increase. And I wasn't able to, um, I didn't have a direct to seller campaign. I was just buying off MLS. And I wasn't able to really generate enough leads to kind of keep things going. So things started to slow down for me. And I accepted it for what it was. And I didn't know how to pivot. And I still, I scaled down from doing, you know, 35, 36 deals a year down to like 12 deals a year. And I think in like 08, right before the market, like really started to get out of control, I got down to like six deals a year, but I had a lot of inventory. I had stuff down in Philly. I was buying blocks of stuff in Philly. Back then you get property in Philly for like 10, 12 grand and like flip it, fix it, put like 10 into it and flip it for like 40. So I had a lot of that stuff going on. And I think I had maybe like almost 32 properties when the market crashed that either they were in mid construction or finished construction, you know, waiting to be closed and the market just collapsed. The bottom fell out. Boom. You know, through that whole process, a lot of stuff happened. Money got tight. I had several businesses, transportation company, car wash, 25 chair hair salon. And then we had like 54 employees. So me and my wife at the time, my former hey, wife, it was more. I want to stop you again. Why is it that the bald guys have the best hair salons? I'm just curious. <laughs> it was real estate for me. So I owned the building. I had three floors and it was a beauty salon on the first floor, a barbershop on the second floor. And it was a tattoo shop on a, in a third floor front and barbershop in the back. So it was 25 stations that I would rent for 250 a week. And I owned the building. So they were essentially their own boss. I did all the marketing, the radio shows, the clubs and all that stuff for them to bring business so they could pay my rent. And so I created a, a, an expense for marketing to drive business. And I ran that shop for maybe like five years, very successfully. Then in my divorce, I had to liquidate pretty much everything, you know, and at the time the market was over. So the music had stopped playing. It got really tough for me. And I was grateful that I did start these other businesses because I had other sources of income. And then it, it forced me to be a landlord because I wasn't a landlord at the time. I wasn't doing any renting. I was just flipping like the, the chunks of cash was sexy. It wasn't, you know, I didn't want to deal with the tenants, so all this trash and termites. So for me, I didn't understand anything about renting. When I switched over to being a landlord, I was literally going knocking on doors, collecting rent, you know, with my kids in the backseat. And it's like, you know, I was like, hold on, this is, I don't, property management, what is that? You know, how does that work? So I reached out to a few property management companies and I really couldn't find anybody who I trusted at the time to kind of take the stuff that I had and, and really carry it. So I started liquidating stuff. I did a fire sale, paid off all my investors. I lost almost $2 million um, yeah. of my own money because a lot of my money for mo a lot of the deals, I didn't have that gap money. I had to put up my own money and start first phase of renovation. I had just got an 18 unit building, which was like one of the biggest units that I got. And I had, you know, 300 grand my money tied into that property. I got it from a tax sale from a guy for about 400 grand. It was 18 unit building. It was worth 2 million when I finished it and then needed only like a half a million in renovation. So it was like, it was great. So I poured my own money into it thinking I would refinance out and get all this cash. And, you know, I wind up getting rid of that in a fire sale and I lost a lot of money and, you know, lost the foundation of family and everything. And pretty much I had to start all over again. So I was able to survive from the few properties that I didn't liquidate, eventually renting them out, generated cash income. I eventually sold the shop. I eventually sold the car wash and really started to focus on me. I think I was pulled in too many different directions and really didn't have any focus. 
it was just, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And me and my former wife actually decided to split because we had agreed that, you know, if we ever get into a position where we're not happy, we'll just let each other go. And at the time we had 54 employees and we would go out, it would just be business, business, business. It was nothing about, you know, enjoying what we had. You know, it was always, oh, what's the next move? What are we going to do? So, you know, eventually she found someone that was not trying to conquer the world and, you know, basically, you know, gave her that feeling she needed. So we wound up splitting. And basically from there, I started all over again. And for me, that was the second best thing that I would say that happened to me because it gave me a chance really to focus on me and to become a better father to my kids and to develop a better relationship with them. I was fortunate to get custody of both my boys. And it kind of forced me by making that move because most guys are weekend dads. And if they're like running around like me, they, you know, be driving a Ferrari or the, or the Bentley and picking up the kids on the weekend and buying them stuff. And they're the greatest dad. Right. But, you know, for me, I didn't want to pass another man to pass his values on to my kids. And I wanted to be the one to raise them. So that really um, hit it home with me and it made me a better man today. So basically fast forwarding, you know, 2011, you know, I kind of, over those couple of years, put myself back together and doing meditation, studying, reading, became a part of a couple of little associations, kind of understanding where the market was at. And I basically stumbled into the note business. I actually created a company paralegal support team for attorneys. Because at the time, loan mods was like booming, loan mods and short sales. Everybody was doing short sales and loan mods. So I kind of pivoted to hiring a, a team of paralegals who understood how to process bankruptcy who understood how to process things to kind of be like a back office for attorneys to process short sales, loan mods and stuff like that. And through one of the the negotiations of the short sales, the negotiator said, Hey, why don't you just buy the note? And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you, you, we, we can't, we can't foreclose on it. Actually, we don't want to foreclose on it. This is in a pool that we're actually selling and you can actually buy this note. So I "I never even heard of that. What the hell is that? How does that work? So he said, we'll just assign the rights of the mortgage in order to you and you can do what you want on it. You can foreclose on it. You can work something out with the homeowner, whatever you want to do. So I had to do my homework. But you're like, and, I'm, I'm here trying to work something out with the homeowner right now. Why don't you do a deal with me? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically, I wound up doing some research and due diligence on it. It took me about two weeks and I started to look at the inventory that I was managing. I was like, wow, I got over 300 loans with Bank of America, this amount of loans with Wells Fargo. Cause we was managing like almost a thousand, you know, files at the time, whether it was short sales, loan mines or whatever. And I was like, wow, you know, we got a couple of hundred loans that we can try to see if we can buy. So I said to the guy, hey, here's the loan numbers. Where are these loans in your funnel? Are you able to sell the notes on these loans? And these are all first mortgages. So he was like, well, let me check whatever, you know, you need capital. Long story short, by me doing my due diligence, I became inquisitive about the note business. And I started to watch webinars and, and seek people out that was professionals in that area. And I ran across a fund in PA called um, PPR, which uh, is a guy named Dave Van Horn. He actually is, is my mentor. And I took a meeting with him and he spent like two and a half hours educating me in the note business. I drove like two hours down to PA where they were and drove two hours back. And after that, I was hooked once he explained to me the power of the notes that you can actually, the bank would sell you to know it at a discount. And back then, for first mortgages, it was easy. It was like 50 cents in a dollar, 40 cents in a dollar, 30 cents in a dollar in some areas. Like some areas you can buy stuff for 20 cents in a dollar. And remember, this is like 2011, 2012. Pricing was really cheap back then because it wasn't a lot of many, a lot of people like you and I in the market space. It was bigger funds that was buying this stuff and they were just flipping paper or working it out. It was like a high-end collection. So I looked at it and I was like, wow, this is great. But he did seconds. He didn't do first. He did second mortgages. And I was like, that's crazy. Who would invest in that? That's risky. Why would somebody buy a second mortgage? That's you're wasting your time. I didn't understand the concept of it. Um, and it was a great discount that he was getting. So um, I started to research that. And then uh, lo and behold, j- took the leap of faith and put $100,000 of my own capital into that space. And within 10 months, I was able to make like 40% returns. And I was like, holy crap. I did this from my laptop, cell phone. I didn't have to deal with any contractors. I didn't have to go to Home Depot. I didn't have to do any of that. This is great. You know, how can I do more? So I seeked out to raise capital for it. The guys who gave me capital for real estate in the beginning, they didn't want to touch it because they didn't understand it. They just wanted to do real estate because if I was not successful, they could take the property. They didn't understand the paper part of it or how to navigate through it. So they didn't want to be involved. 
until I was able to show case studies and what I've done, then they were like, oh, okay, 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 we want to play. So um, I created a fund. I reached out to an SEC attorney. I created a fund and it was a small fund. It was $2 million. And, you know, it took us, you know, a year and a half or so to raise that. And then we were able to grow by deploying that capital into notes. And, you know, today I'm on my fourth fund. You know, I managed over $100 million in debt since 2013. And it's just an exciting place to be. You get to help homeowners stay in the house. You get to share your discount you get with them. And to me, I think it's the greatest investment strategy in the universe compared to real estate. You can manage more notes than property. You can lose money too. I've lost money in deals. I've been stripped in bankruptcy. You know, you just have to know what you're doing. And that's why I purchased seconds because it's more diversity in seconds. A lot of people don't understand that game and it's not for everybody. You can lose money. Definitely for sure. Wow. That was a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back. I want to go back to a couple of things. One of them being, you know, not the first low where you, you had five bullets go through you. Holy cow. But let's go back to that second low that you had. What did you find? Was there any resistance within you to get back up on that horse? Like what started you in your head to get back up after losing all that money, the fire selling all your assets and even losing your wife in the process, right? Your wife and kids. Like what went through your head and how did you get back up? Well, that's a great question. I actually gave up on a game. And that was something I thought I would never do. I went because I've been in sales all my life. And when I found real estate, I was like, I love this business, you know, because, you know, it gave me the ability to go back in a community where I come from. I'm from North New Jersey. So it gave me the ability to go back in the communities and repair the blighted properties and make them a, make it a better place to be. And regardless if I was doing, you know, commercial carpet or new fixtures, it was still better than what it was, um, you know, with new siding windows and all that stuff. So it gave me an affiliate of importance knowing I was adding value to the community. And when I was not able to do that anymore, I was just like, wow. I remember my older brother at the time, he was no longer doing mortgages because the market had crashed and it was a, I was trying to, you know, put myself together over a couple of years and he had pivoted to uh, doing shipping over containers overseas. I think it was like metal or compressors or something. Those little things in the bottom refrigerator, like I don't know if it was copper or something or whatever it was. They was making a lot of money. They were getting like 20 grand a container. And it was probably like maybe, I don't know, $6,000 profit a container. And they was, you know, shipping like, you know, 10 containers a month or something like that. And it was like pure, it was a great business. And I was like, damn, he's like, you can do this too. You can do this in New Jersey. We can set you up a hub. So I'm out looking for places of, of old newspaper companies that shut down that had storage space. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this thing. And it was like, okay, you had to like go to junkyards. You had to go to certain places. And I remember I went to one junkyard and I pulled up. And I was like, do I really want to do this? <laughs> By the way, everybody, he's from Jersey. Like, holy cow. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, like junkyard I really... in Jersey is even worse. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. <laughs> I was like, do I really want to do this? So I stepped out. I had my Tim's on and everything. And I'm like, I can't see myself doing this. So I immediately got back in the car. I had an office in the third floor of my salon. And I, and I went there and I sat in the office. And I was like, I was just bummed out. And then later on that day, I remember just laying on, laying on my back in my bed, looking at the ceiling, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I slept on it. And something just told me, stay in there. The market is not going to be down forever. It's going to turn around, connect with the right people, stay in, stay in, stay in. And that's, that's pretty much what I did. I'm um, as far as with my kids in the beginning, they came with me for a week, went with her for a week. So it gave me the chance to kind of have a week to kind of do what I needed to do to put myself back together and then go back to, you know, being a dad. And after probably three months of that, actually longer than that, after a year of that, I was like, you know, they need stability. It's just too much back and forth. So we made the final decision to let them come with me permanently. So that kind of grounded me. And then I was able to take off from there. So, I mean, it was a lot of ups and downs that I went through emotionally, but you know, that's part of life, right? That's part of, that's what makes you who you are once you go through that and build that resilience, you know? And that's, pretty much exactly the reason why we started this particular podcast. And a lot of listeners, like we love hearing about real estate strategies. We love hearing about how to better our businesses, but I focus so hard on the person and the mindset, right? Because people like you and I, who've been through our struggles and been through our challenges, I truly feel that like anybody can learn a real estate strategy. Anybody can learn a better business practice, but to have the discipline or have gone through the shit, the mental capacity to shift, right? or to keep going when it's hard, like to, to get yourself up in the morning when the whole world is falling around you. Like, and I focus in on that big time. And thank you for sharing your stories because you've got two major ones here 
And now you're back up on this note business. So, you know, I wanted to really kind of hit home on that mindset shift. And now if we talk more about your note business itself. So when you got into it, my understanding is, and and I'm going to ask you some questions, but obviously I know you can't spill secret sauces. So feel free to say that secret sauce. I don't want any of that. But when you started this business, you had that mentor, you know, who's running seconds and you literally were just doing a short sale negotiation and had that paralegal firm. And they said, Hey, why don't you buy this note? Like, was it that easy back then? You started just calling servicers to try to grab, you know, and grab whatever notes you had, or you found like one servicer and then you went and fi- went into your paralegal side and said, okay, we've got X amount of notes with this company. So we're going to try to work with this guy, see if we can't get all of them. Is that what you did to start? What, what I did immediately, because I fell in love with the note business, I started to dismantle the paralegal company. You know, I had a partner at the time and I was like, hey, listen, you know, I don't want any parts of this anymore. I want to focus on this business. This is like pure real estate it's like being at the top of the pinnacle, right? So I, you get to actually buy the paper from the bank. I really want to focus on this. I want to go raise capital on this. I had already deployed some of my money. I built case studies. I kind of knew to got a gist of how it worked and I wanted to focus 100% on that. So I kind of sold off my share of the company. Actually, we had like maybe like eight employees at the time and two people you know, wanted to ride along with me on this new venture. So I took those two people and sold off my percentage at a big discount to my partner at the time in that company. And then we started to literally open up shop right next door. And then we started to like build this business from the ground up. And for me, I was able to go to conventions, seminars and everything else where the note players were and connect with some of the vendors. And at those events was where I was able to develop relationships with people who sold these assets. Uh, going direct to a bank, that was pure luck when the guy said, why don't you just buy the note? Because it's rare, that can happen, but it's rare that you can get in through a major bank and go ahead and buy, you know, an asset like that. Um, they usually have broker channels that they go through and sell off the stuff in large tranches instead of a one-off basis. So this was like a really, you know, weird situation that this happened. So basically I established relationships with people who would carve out trades that you can buy for a hundred thousand, fifty thousand. And I started on that level uh, before I started to look at the paperwork they were sending me and look at the chain of the assignments. And I just followed the chain of assignments. Where did it originate from? Who bought a second? Who bought a third? And then once I was able to get data on the higher up the chain, I started marketing to those guys and calling those guys because it was funds at that level. The bank would sell to a fund and then a fund would sell to another fund and to another fund. And that's how it trickled down. So I would go up to the ladder to a fund who purchased it from the bank and establish communication with those guys, send my paperwork that I'm a buyer and all of the due diligence information. And Basically, I started getting relationships with that. And then I started to find out where those guys hung out at, which is like a IMN or one of those events. And I started to travel at those events and make connections with those guys. Because the seminars I would go to were like 150 bucks. You fly to Vegas, you get a ticket. And these events were like 2,500 bucks for a ticket. So it was different players. you know. So I started to go to Texas, to the national servicing conferences. And most of those guys would be there to find out the regulations and laws and stuff was happening. So I just started to follow that trend. MBA and all those other Mortgage Bankers Association, all those other events. And I would be there with people who ran $50 million, $100 million, $500 million funds. I was completely out of place, but I was in a place where I can make the connections and eventually, uh, you know, get some assets to buy seconds pretty much. So that's what my focus was. But that's pretty much how I gained the relationships to buy this stuff. There it is. That was a secret sauce, everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to put in the work. Not everybody's willing to put in the work. I mean, it's not as easy as just going to the place, exchanging a business card, and they saying, hey, here's a tape for the loans. I mean, you have to call these guys constantly, constantly go to those events, get the note, press the flesh. You know, they have to see you around, and, and eventually they'll deal with you, right? Because why would they send it to you, one person, when they could send it to a broker and create a bidding war and get the highest price, right? So it's all about relationships. That's it. Nice work, dude. So right now, I have two more follow-up questions for you. Number one would be, in your day-to-day right now, what is it that you're doing in the business world? And I'm going to follow that up with your personal life, like your routine. Yeah. So I mean, in the business world with me is, I have a fund that I raise capital for, for real estate, real properties, and notes. And the real property we do is local New Jersey. The last 20 years where I've been investing, we do buy and hold, fix and flips, we just pivoted to sub 350 for the fix and flips. I was doing high end stuff. I'm caught on the market right now with one for like 750. I just lowered the price to get rid of that last high end property. 
And then with the note stuff, you know, we constantly doing due diligence. We constantly looking for trades, managing our vendors. We have a power team, which consists of our asset managers, attorneys, realtors, our vendors, our document custodians. So just going through the management processes of that, of that that's pretty much what the day-to-day consists of. Me, you know, I'm always raising capital and looking for deals. But it's awesome. The way the hunter should be, right? That's good stuff. With the challenges that you've been through and now having full custody of your kids and being in charge, like you said, of kind of teaching them your values and what you believe in, I would love to hear your routine during the day. Because as a, you know, single dad myself, I struggle a lot when, especially with in the days of homeschooling, which we're now in, like, you know, like, do you mind sharing kind of your routine? Sure, for sure. For me, it starts at 3.30, 4 a.m. in the morning. That's my time. Um, I get up around that time and really journal, write my goals down, do my yoga, basically my 25 minutes of reading. Then I go for my run or my exercise, and I exercise every other day. I used to do every day, but I kind of fell back from that because I was killing my body. So I do every other day workout, and then I'm grounded. Right. I did my morning routine. That takes me somewhere around two to two and a half hours to get all of that stuff done. And once I, I'm done with that, get dressed. And then now it's time to really go through my processes for the day I have. So I time block through the day to make sure I get stuff done. So I kind of have a list that I go through of in the highest priority the things that I need to accomplish for the day. And then I time block them out. And my, every Sunday I, I block for the week of things I need to do. And then I do it daily. OK. During these hours where I have the most time before my kids get up, now they get up at nine, well, before they used to get up at seven because homeschooling is a little late. So that gives me more time to kind of knock out the most important things in the morning before my staff come and get emails and everything else. So by the time I get my kids up, majority of the most important thing or the one most important things I need to do to get closer to my goal is done. You know, if I've blocked out an hour and a half to kind of work on it, that's done and everything else fall throughout the day. You know, then my kids do the homeschool and they're 12 and 17. So they're pretty much independent. I just got to make sure they get up on time and do what they're supposed to do because it's homeschooling. So they're a little bit lazier now, you know, and now I'm a chef. I kind of cook them those meals that the school don't provide through the day. <laughs> so I stay home to do that. And then pretty much after two o'clock is when I kind of go out a couple of days a week in the field and check on various projects, make sure my GCs and everybody on point with inspections and the timeline and everything else. So that's pretty much what my day consists. After that is even in maybe playing some board games with my son or taking a walk or, you know, just chilling with those guys. That's awesome. They are fairly independent at this point. How was it when they were little, little smaller? We're not, not fairly independent. I mean, I still have to remind them to brush their teeth and do all the other <laughs> stuff. So that's, that's, that's still, still going with even my 17 year old and I still cook, you know what I mean? So just trying to get them to, cook good food that's not fast and quick and, you know, be able to shop on their own. That's always a mission for me. But parenthood is really, you know, it's like running a business. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a lot of different things that you have to go through, but it's all growth. Like the, the challenges that you go through, I feel make me become a better man, a better father, better provider. So, you know, I don't complain about it. I just do what I need to do and try to be the example for them. So when they get to this position, they'll remember the things I did. And they'll probably try to do better. Totally. 100% agree with that last sentiment. And it's funny because our business is our business, but you know, raising our kids with our values is a, another business, is another full-time position, right? Working on ourselves and our own relationship with our inner voices and you know, God or the universe, or whatever we believe in. Like Every single thing that we do for ourselves, it's tough to block it, which is why I was curious how you did it. And it sounds like you've got your own time in the morning there, which is brilliant you know you head out at like two o'clock to do the site work which is even better good stuff yeah i mean it's it's tough you know not every day is on time things happen things may come up in the mix that might throw me off but i, I try my best to kind of stay on course with what i had or originally planned you know the only way it will work and this is the next level what i'm trying to do is get like a va to kind of monitor my email respond and, and kind of batch things up so i can do the voxer and kind of communicate and then do all that. So that's the next level where I'm trying to get to to kind of free up more time because my inbox piles up like crazy. Literally takes me, you know, sometimes 40 minutes or so to kind of sort through the important stuff and kind of get things done. So that's next level. That will get me at least two to three hours more a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know that. I might be able to help you on that one. I finally figured that out, but it took me two years. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Fuquan, how can people uh, learn more about you, get in touch with you, all that sort of stuff? Sure. My website is nngcapitalfund.com. 
You can go there and find more about what we do. And my email address is fbalau at nngcapitalfund.com. It's fantastic. And what is the most exciting thing that you're working on right now? Oh, I have a, a 48 doors that I'm working on taking down. It's a, a hard money lender. Uh, it's a deal that went south and a person who was doing renovation, it kind of fell apart when this whole COVID thing took place. So, you know, they're looking at liquidating this portfolio and I'm second runner up. So I have to finish, you know, some due diligence to try to increase my numbers to take this trade down. So I'm working on that now. So pretty excited about that. In my personal life, I'm just planning. I have to replan what we already had planned for the summer, some of the trips and stuff we have. Of course, things are changing. So I'm working on doing that, trying to do some more outdoor stuff, like dirt bike riding with my kids and four wheeler and all of this stuff. So local here in New Jersey or Delaware. So, you know, I don't know how to travel things are going to be and I don't want to expose them or what's going to happen. So we'll see. You got it, man. That's awesome. Folks, that was Fuquan Bil- Bilal. I still think you know last name, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. A man who was shot five times and then <laughs> made a ton of money, had lots of things, and then lost everything and came back. That was way more than even bargained for today, Fuquan. That was, I asked you if you had a challenge to go through and overcome, and you didn't really mention a lot of that. <laughs> it's like, holy oh, yeah, cow. Yeah. Not me. yeah, I wrote a book too. It's called Passion for Real Estate Investments. It's on Amazon. I kind of talk about my backstory in the book. Passion for, what, say it again. A passion for real estate investment. A passion yeah. for real estate investment on Amazon yep. going through his story. Fantastic. Awesome stuff, man. Well, um, thank you all for taking so much, taking part in another episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast, where we bring as much value as we can by sharing top quality guests and speakers. A huge thank you again today to Fuquan for sharing his story and talking to us about note investing, how we get started and what he's up to today. It's pretty cool. It's a new topic. We haven't had that on yet. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons below if you're on YouTube, if you're on Google Podcasts, if you're on iTunes and Spotify, whatever you're on, please like and subscribe and share to be notified when we have the new podcasts released. And head on over to shutupanddoitrealestate.com for all the episodes. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Fuquan, and we'll see you on the next one. 